Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good morning dear students, we were learning about the chemical mediators of inflammation in the last class. So we learnt that chemical mediators are substances that initiate or regulate the inflammatory response. They could be either cell derived or plasma derived. We learnt some of the cell derived mediators in the last class which are vasoactive amines like histamine, serotonin. We also learnt about arachidonic acid metabolites which give rise to two pathways producing important chemical mediators like prostaglandins and leukotrienes. So we will continue and learn about some more of these cell derived and plasma derived chemical mediators in today's class. So next we learn about a very important group of chemical mediators that is complement system. Now complement system is a group of plasma proteins and as the name says they complement or assist the immune system to destroy the bacteria or the pathogens. Now these are produced in the liver. Most of the plasma derived mediators that are involved in inflammation are produced in the liver and released into the circulation. Now normally these complements are in an inactive form. In the absence of inflammation they are in an inactive form. But once an infection occurs, they get activated and then it results in a cascade. One gets activated, activates the other. So a series of complement proteins get activated in inflammation and are responsible for various effects of inflammatory response. So as you can see here, there are nine complement proteins C1 to C9. It does not mean that C1 is generated and then C2, C3, C4. It is not according to how it is generated in the sequence. It is named as how it was discovered uh, in the early days. So C1 is generated first. So we can uh, see this, the complements are activated whenever there is an infection. So infection is the trigger for complements to be activated. There are three mechanisms by which the complements are activated. The first and the most important is a classical pathway. So what is classical pathway of complement generation? Here the antigens on the bacteria when they bind to the antibodies that is when the complements get activated. So this is the classical pathway of complement activation. The second pathway is the bacteria, the antigens on the bacteria themselves activate the complements without binding of antibodies as in case of classical. So the alternate pathway of complement is activated by the bacteria directly. Now the third pathway or less important pathway is a lectin pathway. Here bacteria which have manos on their surface activate the complements through a lectin pathway. So these are the three mechanisms by which the complement can get activated. So number one is a classical pathway which is activated when there is binding of antigen and antibodies. Number two the bacteria themselves. Number three is the lectin pathway which is activated by manos binding lectins. So let us look at this classical pathway. Just look at this animation for a minute and then we will go to the explanation and see how it is generated. So let us go back to this. So you see that when there is antibody binding, when there is antibody binding to the bacterial cell wall, that is when the classical pathway gets activated. The C1 binds to the antigen antibody complex. This cleaves the C4 to C4A and B and then 2 to 2A and 2B. 
Now this 4B and 2A combines and this is what is called as a C3 convertase. As the name says, C3 convertase converts C3 into C3A and C3B. Now C3B comes and binds back to the C4B and 2A and this is now the C5 convertase. So C5 comes and binds to this and gets split to C5A and 5B. Now the 5B that is generated here binds to the bacterial cell wall. Now this consecutively activates C6, C7, C8 and several of C9 which forms a bore or drills hole into the membrane of the bacterial cell wall resulting in cellular lysis. So this is the classical pathway. So we learnt here that classical pathway begins when there is an antibody binding to the bacterial cell wall. This attracts the C1 complement protein. C1 cleaves C4 and C2. The C4B and 2A is a C3 convertase which converts C3 to 3A and 3B. 3B again binds to the 4B 2A and is now C5 convertase, converts C5 to C5A and B. 5B comes and attaches to the bacterial cell wall and consecutively activates C6, 7, 8 and 9 and the 9 forms a hole on the bacterial cell wall causing cell lysis. So this is the classical pathway of complement. The C5B to 9 is called as the membrane attack complex. Now let us look at the alternate complement pathway. As we learnt, alternate complement pathway does not involve binding of antibodies to the bacterial cell wall. Here the bacteria, the bacterial antigens themselves activate the alternate pathway. Now in this pathway, because of the bacterial infection, some of the C3 with that circulates in the blood gets cleaved to C3A and C3B. The C3B attaches to the bacterial cell wall and then there are factors called as factor B and D which are also present in circulation which bind to the bacterial cell wall along with the C3B. Now this converts the B to BB and BA. Watch this. The BB along with C3B is the C3 convertase here. Now the further steps are similar to what we saw in classical complement pathway. So this cleaves the C3 into C3A and C3B. The C3B further attaches to this complex and this is now C5B convertase. So this attaches to C5, causes C5 convertase to C5A and C5B. C5B attaches to the cell wall and the subsequent steps that you saw in the classical pathway is what is formed in alternate pathway as well and you have the C9 which is formed drills holes on the cell membrane of the bacteria and is the membrane attack complex. So what are the functions of complement in inflammation? Number 1, C3B acts as an opsonin. We learnt in the previous class that bacteria for them to be recognized by the phagocytes, they need to be coated by substances called as opsonins. And some of the known opsonins are the complement component C3B. Chemotaxis, the C5A that is generated during the complement cascade is a potent chemotactic agent. It attracts neutrophils. C3A and C5A are called as anaphylotoxins because they cause vasodilatation and increase permeability. They basically do this by activating the mast cells releasing histamine. So C5A and C3A are called as anaphylotoxins. And as we saw, the C5B to 9 is the membrane attack complex that drill, drills hole on the bacterial cell wall resulting in cell lysis. So we can see here the complements are involved in every step of the inflammatory response in, uh, that occurs when there is infection. So this picture shows the same. We can see here that the, on the right side below you can see the bacteria are coated by the C3B which are opsonins. This attracts the phagocytes and they phagocytize the bacteria which are coated by C3B. On your left lower corner you can see that the C3A and C5A are acting on the mast cells to release histamine and thereby causing vasodilatation and increased vascular permeability. Also we see that C5A 
causes attraction of phagocytes, so chemotaxis, it attracts the phagocytes to the site of bacteria. And on the top, we can see the two pathways of generation of complements, the alternate complement which occurs when there is by the, uh, only the bacteria activates the complement pathway and the classical pathway is when the antibody and the antigen complexes are formed. Next coming to the plasma derived mediators. We already learnt about the complements. Now, the other factors that are involved in inflammation are the plasma derived factors which include the fibrinolytic system, the clotting system and the kinin system. All the fibrinolytic and the clotting system converge at the complement system thereby producing various complement factors which we just learnt play an important role in inflammation. The kinin system, the bradykinin that is generated to the kinin system causes vasodilatation, increased vascular permeability and is also important for the generation of pain that you get at the site of inflammation. The next cell derived molecule is platelet activating factor. It is also generated from the membrane phospholipid just like leukotrienes and prostaglandins. The source of platelet activating factor are the mast cells, basophils, neutrophils, macrophages and platelets themselves. So, you can see a wide range of cells that produce pl platelet activating factor. It has multiple effects in inflammation, one of them being platelet aggregation. So, it is produced by platelet and it activates platelets and causes aggregation of platelets and also it causes vasodilatation and increased vascular permeability. Next, we have nitric oxide or NO. So, nitric oxide is normally produced by endothelial cells. Again, we learnt in the last class that macrophages can produce nitrous oxide in inflammation by the production of an enzyme called as INOS that generates nitric oxide by macrophages in inflammation. So, what is the action of nitric oxide? It causes vasodilatation and is also a potent microbicidal agent. So, you can see here the endothelial cells are producing the nitric oxide and they themselves act on endothelial cells causing vasodilatation. In addition, macrophages generate nitric oxide during inflammation because of the activation of the enzyme INOS and the nitric oxide that is produced by the macrophages results in microbicidal killing. So, to summarize the key concepts about chemical mediators, we learned that vasoactive amines, the important ones here are histamine and serotonin result in vasodilatation and increased vascular permeability. The next set of chemical mediators are arachidonic acid metabolites. In this group, we have the prostaglandins and the leukotrienes. Both of them are responsible for various inflammatory responses. For example, vascular reactions that you see in inflammation, leukocyte chemotaxis, etc. And also we learned that there is a set of arachidonic acid derived metabolite called as lipoxins which has an anti-inflammatory uh, pathology. Next comes cytokines. Cytokines as the name says are generated by the cells. Various types of cells produce cytokines. They have multiple effects. They result in leukocyte recruitment and migration and there are several cytokines. The most important ones being IL-1, IL-8, TNF and chemokines. We just learnt about the complement proteins. We learnt that they are generated to the classical pathway, alternate pathway and the lectin pathway and again they have multiple effects in inflammation. They are responsible for the vascular events, they are responsible for the cellular events and killing of the microbes. Kinins that are produced through the kinin system is also an important uh, factor that plays a role in inflammation, particularly the pain that you get in inflammation is caused by bradykinin. So, this again summarizes the effects of chemical mediators. So, the factors that are involved in vasodilatation are importantly histamine, serotonin, prostaglandins and the nitric oxide. Increased vascular permeability again histamine, serotonin, prostaglandins, 
C3A and C5A which we learnt are called as anaphylotoxins cause the release of histamine by mast cells producing increased vascular permeability and platelet activation factor. Then we have the chemotaxis. The factors that are responsible for chemotaxis are C5A, leukotriene B4 and the cytokines. Then we have the pain which is brought about by prostaglandins and bradykinins. The fever is mostly brought about by cytokines. So, this summarizes the effects of various mediators and their effects in inflammatory response. So, that brings us to what is the outcome of acute inflammation. We learned that the cells in the molecules from circulation emigrate to the site of inflammation and they cause degradation or killing of the bacterial agent. So, what is the outcome? So, whenever there is injury by say infection or any other agents, there is tissue destruction which attracts the inflammatory cells resulting in acute inflammation. Now, this can completely destroy the offending agent and there is resolution. If there is a significant tissue damage, the site of injury can heal with fibrosis or what is called as scarring. However, if the acute inflammation is not able to tackle the injury and the injury persists, then it will go into chronic inflammation. So, this is the outcome of, of inflammation. The most favorable is the complete resolution. If there is a significant damage, then it results in fibrosis or scarring. And if the injury persists, the inflammation is not able to tackle the inflammation, then it goes into chronic inflammation. So, you can see here, this is a case of acute tonsillitis. You can see the tonsils are enlarged, congested and swollen and this is complete resolution and this is what we normally see. A tonsillitis with treatment or if it is viral without treatment resolves completely. This is because the inflammation is able to destroy or tackle the offending agent with complete resolution of the offending of the injurious agent. So, sometimes we have seen that inflammation, the, when there is a tissue destruction, it heals with a scar. So, as we learned, there can be complete resolution when there is elimination of the offending agent and regeneration of the tissue that is injured. Healing by connective tissue, when there is a significant tissue damage and regeneration cannot occur completely, the the site of injury is replaced by connective tissue that is fibrosis or scar and if the injurious agent is not able to be eliminated or if there is a persistent infection, it progresses to chronic inflammation. So, these are the outcomes of acute inflammation. So, we have seen here whenever there is injury, the picture shows in inflammation, the vessels are dilated and there is a lot of outpouring of fluid and inflammatory cells to the site of injury. So, on the right you can see that if the injurious agent is completely eliminated, then the tissue resolves to its normal uh, uh, function. However, in some instances when there is a lot of tissue damage, it may be uh, converted to a scar because of lot of fibrosis. However, if the injury is persistent, you can see there that uh, the inflammation persists and the inflammatory cells now are replaced, the neutrophils and the macrophages are replaced mostly by lymphocytes and plasma cells which we will learn in the next class are the main players in chronic inflammation and cro whenever there is chronic inflammation, there is more tissue injury, there is more fibrosis and more vascular proliferation which are the main features that you see in chronic inflammation. So, in today's class, we learnt about the chemical mediators of inflammation and the outcome of acute inflammation. So, in the next class, we learn about the different morphological types of acute inflammation and also a bit about the chronic inflammation. Thank you.